Um, all right, I think everyone's out of the waiting room now. Um, welcome to day three of the Digital Scriptorium 2.0 planning meetings. Um, thanks for sticking around. Um, for the second week, we have a great turnout still, so that's really exciting. Um, today is our last day of presentations um, from outside projects. We're going to be hearing from Ben Alberton, who's going to talk about IIIF. I'm going to be speaking about the Mapping Manuscript Migrations Project, and Deborah Cashin is going to be talking about Metascripta. Um, and after that, we'll all go to our breakout rooms as usual. Um, we have made a slight update to the agenda for Thursday, and I just chatted out the link to the Google Drive folder where you can find the agenda. Um, but people in the exit surveys have been asking for more time with their breakout groups. So on Thursday, instead of starting immediately with breakout group presentations, um, we're going to meet with our breakout groups again for 30 minutes for a final wrap up and um, plan for your presentations. So that's how we'll start the day on Thursday and then we'll do the breakout group presentations as planned and then um, a big group discussion afterwards to hash out um, any disagreements uh, that remain. So it should be a really fun day and I hope you all will join us for that. Um, and another note about Thursday, we are planning on recording the breakout group presentations and the discussion afterwards. So if you're uncomfortable with your, your image appearing during that, um, you can mute your video and participate via the chat. Um, or if you'd rather not be recorded at all, um, keep that in mind and maybe let your group know that you um, you won't be there on Thursday. So uh, with that, I will introduce our first speaker. Ben Alberton is the Rare Books Curator and Curator for Classics at Stanford Libraries. Before that, he spent 10 years managing digital projects and international collaborations including Parker on the Web, collaborations with the Vatican Libraries, and he helped to develop the International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, you are welcome to live tweet this presentation, and I'm chatting out Ben's Twitter tag now. Um, and with that, I will turn the screen over to Ben. Welcome. Thank you. And let me just see if I can get this sharing set up the way it should be. Let's see. All right, are you all seeing my presentation and not my note slides? Yes. Okay, great. All right, um, well, it's kind of funny talking about IIIF to this particular crowd because many of you are all already active participants and experts in many cases. Um, but I'm gonna walk through IIIF from the point of view of an interoperability framework and how that might play into DS 2.0 and particularly into the ideas of registries that have been floating around, uh, both in discussions and notes. Um, so just a, a quick reminder to everybody, uh, the International Image Interoperability Framework got started about a decade ago, primarily as a, an, a project to increase interoperability between manuscript repositories. So we spent two years working on medieval manuscripts and sharing between institutions. Uh, with early participation from people that you already know, like eCodices, um, Gallica, and now Biblissima, uh, and um, Cambridge, Stanford, Harvard, um, sort of the, the folks that um, had repositories right around 2010 and were interested in sharing content. Uh, IIIF has grown quite a bit over the years, uh, but I'm going to focus on just a, a few aspects of it that I think are most related to how we might think about uh, manuscript studies, in particular Digital Scriptorium 2.0. The main takeaway is that IIIF creates portable digital objects. That is, every repository is sending their stuff out uh, via their own portals, but those objects can also be picked up and taken elsewhere. Uh, and reused and reused and reused over time in different contexts. And they do this by one little piece of metadata, and we're not going to dive into this in too much detail, but the IIIF manifest is the thing that makes IIIF content portable. Uh, and it takes digital images, 
uh, maps them onto uh, a data structure. And then that data structure can be read by different viewers, by different programs, by different platforms, uh, and reused. So um, first point in relationship to digital scriptorium is that um, it's not necessary to be a image repository, um, but uh, a platform like DS could be making use of portable digital objects that are out there in the wild already with participating institutions. Uh, and what does that look like? Well, the simplest use case that we started with 10 years ago was that of comparison across repositories. And this was the motivating factor for IIIF in general. Um, at the time, Stanford had just launched Parker on the web and there were other institutions that were being uh, funded uh, by a number of funders uh, that also had content to share. But the thing that we heard from almost every user um, including people like Lisa Fagan Davis, was the desire to put images side by side from different repositories. And so IIIF makes it possible to pull content from different repositories into a single user interface uh, for that sort of comparison purpose. And so that's what I mean by a digital object. We've pulled an image here out of the Vatican Library, dropped it into a IIIF viewer, and can now compare side by side. Um, different representations of that manuscript. So far, I think this is probably familiar territory to a lot of people on the call, uh, but this is, this is the key uh, idea that we'll be working with over the next couple of minutes. So, uh, duplicated there. Um, the other main thing that we've been doing with IIIF is pulling those digital objects out of their uh, repository context and dropping them into more narrative contexts. So using IIIF to tell stories in a number of different ways through online exhibits or through scholarly presentations. And here we see uh, the Vatican who's using IIIF to drive uh, a Greek paleography course. Uh, so dropping their objects in uh, for uh, sort of a guided use for users. Uh, something that's not terribly easy to sustain from the repository point of view, but by IIIF, uh, the curators at the Vatican are able to build up narrative around their digital objects to, um, to work with. And then, of course, IIIF is the, the driver behind a lot of projects that we know already, like Fragmentarium, uh, which brings together and then reserves images of digital manuscript fragments. Uh, or eScripta or Transcribus, which are allowing um, import via IIIF into an external platform to do something with it. In this case, um, automated uh, text recognition. Uh, and the nice thing about IIIF is that it allows the sort of movement uh, back and forth between platforms. One of the challenges of IIIF is that it doesn't necessarily provide a wonderful platform for reintegrating all of this information that's created out in the wild. So for instance, uh, with the Global Currents project that was run between Stanford and Montreal, uh, we fed images out via IIIF to a machine learning lab, uh, which recognized initials uh, across about 100,000 manuscript pages. Uh, and we're able to manipulate that data. All of these images that you're seeing are being served by IIIF live. Uh, well, recorded right now, but live when I recorded it. Um, and what we haven't been able to do then is reintegrate those well back into Parker on the web. Uh, so the data is out there and the reuse is not necessarily uh, as straightforward. The other thing that we see is uh, the use of repository images for all kinds of ephemeral things like games or toys for engaging wider audiences. Uh, so IIIF makes all of these things possible. Many of you have actually done some of these projects already. Uh, so this, this should be a fairly familiar sort of discussion. What I'd like to do uh, for the remainder of my time then is talk about how IIIF might play into Digital Scriptorium 2.0 and what it might mean to tie into a, a national or international repository as well. Uh, 
So one of the things that we saw with IIIF fairly quickly was rapid growth and distribution of resources. And this is the current map of the IIIF community uh, participants uh, found live on the IIIF.io page. And you can see that we've got content spread across multiple continents, uh, clustered right now in North America and Europe, but that is slowly uh, starting to spread out a little bit more evenly across the world. Uh, and one of the things that we'll see is that some of these institutions have one or two medieval manuscripts that we might be interested in and are, are richer in more modern content, and some are very manuscript heavy. Um, so there's a, an unevenness of content distribution, um, but a, a fairly broad spread of institutional uh, content. And what we can do is talk numbers just a little bit. So when IIIF was firmly established in 2012-2013, uh, we were looking at several thousand manuscripts being available via IIIF, with ecodices, our friends in Switzerland, being um, by far the, the most um, content-rich site. And the tail then uh, was, you know, not an order of magnitude different. Uh, but then in 2018 and 19, the world uh, had changed. So in a brief six-year period, uh, we saw institutions like the Bayonet from the Vatican really starting to put their content up online to the point where we're looking at, uh, you know, a year, year and a half ago, at 100,000 or more uh, manuscripts available. And then we expect uh, a paradigm shift over the next three to five years as uh, more portals become available with full digitization. And that growth is being driven by large institutions, of course, the people who have most access to, to manuscripts. Uh, so the German manuscript portal has a goal of 60,000 manuscripts being available in the next couple of years. Uh, the Vatican is on their way towards their goal of 80,000. I think they're about a quarter of the way through their digitization project now. But so we're seeing a real um, abundance of content coming through. But, and perhaps more interestingly for North American institutions, we also are seeing content coming in from many, many small institutions. And I'm showing you here the OCLC ResearchWorks IIIF Explorer that exposes content DM content. And as we know, many hundreds of institutions here in North America have their content in content DM uh, and thus being served by IIIF and therefore aggregatable in a, a search tool like this. But the big question with IIIF and the thing that has become probably the largest challenge for the community right now is discovery. Um, we know that we've got 100,000 or more medieval manuscripts out there in IIIF, but how do you find these things? Uh, and that traditional way of going is, of course, going to an institutional site. Uh, so the Huntington Digital Library, looking for their manuscripts and looking through their metadata. Um, Harvard now shows up right behind the Huntington as a, a nice portal, one of the, the nicer new portals. And of course, Stanford has ours. And, you know, you could repeat this process um, manuscript repository by manuscript repository um, to do that sort of in-depth discovery. Uh, and uh, one of our our colleagues, I think, uh, said it best in, on Twitter um, that there are great resources out there, but you still already need to know exactly or almost exactly what you're looking for to find man manuscripts across institutions. Uh, and I could not agree more. Um, what we've seen more recently is a rise of aggregators. Uh, so the Biblissima aggregation portal, which is pulling together largely European um, IIIF collections and making them available in an almost Google-like search. So they've got, I think now, probably 10,000 or more, more manuscripts, but about 70 or 80,000 manuscripts available through Biblissima. And they have spent time harmonizing the metadata across all of these institutions, which is a fairly expensive prospect. Uh, and I'd just like to focus on a few of the other challenges that an aggregator like this faces, which is long-term upkeep, uh, both of the portal and of the content, and then synchronization with the hosting institutions. So as Parker on the, the web, for instance, updates their metadata, 
um, it's unclear what the synchronization process is with the aggregator. Are they automatically pulling the metadata hosted by Parker, or is there more of a push model uh, required here? So that's uh, sort of the European portal that we've seen grow up. And then just to focus back in on uh, the OCLC aggregator, uh, we've seen basically a content provider focused aggregator uh, and they have some control over the parameters of the metadata already and so can control the metadata aspects of their discovery interface. So that's sort of where we are right now in the IIIF world. Uh, I'd like to close with um, a, a couple of slides basically thinking about both the assumptions that we're operating under in IIIF and then what that might mean for a Digital Scriptorium 2.0 or a National Registry of Manuscripts. Uh, the first assumption that we make in the IIIF world, of course, is that IIIF will continue to play a role in content interoperability over the next decade. Uh, IIIF doesn't in and of itself have a, a goal to be an aggregator, um, but discovery is definitely on our minds as a community thinking about how we might make the content easier to aggregate or um, mine uh, from the communities that might want to use them but focus is really on that portability rather than uh, building, building a platform uh, against that content. Another assumption is that as we have seen over the last decade, multiple aggregators and discovery sites will continue to be built in the decade ahead, often reusing the same content, often in different contexts. So no, there, the expectation is that there won't be a single uh, point of discovery to, to kind of rule them all. Uh, the assumption also is that institutions, at least most, possibly many, uh, will maintain their description metadata in a variety of formats on their own institutional schedules. Uh, so updating metadata as they need to and probably not harmonizing it up front for an aggregator. The other assumption, of course, is for aggregators that data maintenance, at least rich metadata maintenance, will continue to be an expensive prospect over time. It's a person heavy uh, and reiterative process. And finally, we uh, assume that digital humanities tools will continue to be ephemeral and distributed. Uh, so purpose built in some cases uh, for specific projects or to serve certain audiences and communities over time, and that uh, they may contribute back to repositories or they may not. So that kind of moves to the, the goal from a IIIF perspective about what a registry of manuscripts or uh, an aggregator of manuscripts might look like. And the main goal, I think, would be to just include that IIIF manifest information if it's available. Uh, so a link to the manifest for each object would be a minimal contribution back in a registry. If a manifest is available, let's put it in there. Uh, that doesn't mention polling those manifests to make sure that they're still live three to five years from now, but it's something to consider. Within each manifest, there are links to structured metadata for every object, so there could be some mining of that structured metadata, uh, but there doesn't have to be. Uh, it would be nice from a registry perspective to be able to select all IIIF enabled manuscripts as a group uh, so that if an aggregator wanted to build a front end uh, or a portal, uh, they could do that, filtering in various ways. A registry could include a viewer for IIIF content or thumbnails uh, drawn via the IIIF service for content as a, as a nice to have or a bolt on, but it certainly wouldn't be a requirement. and. Um, it would be an interesting way of um, sort of showing a user what was available via IIIF, but there's always the pointer back to the, the host institution via the manifest to do that sort of image delivery uh, in the, in the um, registry. The other thing to note, of course, I mentioned earlier, is that linked data may be at variance with registry metadata fields over time as institutions update, so that's something to consider. Uh, but one of the things that we leave with, I think, is um, whatever gets built is not to try to be everything to everybody. That is, because of IIIF, a registry doesn't have to be a discovery environment and a working portal and a hub for scholarly work, uh, but rather a, a direction to, to think about is carving out an area of expertise within that linked data world 
uh, that a registry or DS 2.0 could, could be and excel at. And that's, uh, that's me for IIIF and DS 2.0. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, that's great advice that you provided uh, for us to think about as we're building DS 2.0. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ben? Feel free to raise your hand or uh, post something in the chat. Um, if, if there aren't any questions for now, um, did, did Vanessa uh, raise her hand? Oh, um, yeah, I did. I had a quick question. Oh, go ahead. But I just wondered, thank you so much for that talk. I never tire of hearing you talk about this and I learn something every time. So don't stop doing these presentations. Um, I just wondered at the end when you were talking about DS as a registry, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that term of registry versus DS as a catalog um, or like a union catalog and, and if the term registry is synonymous for you with catalog or where, how that fits in with what you're thinking about. Thanks, Vanessa. That, that's a great question. So one of the things that we've been very aware of with IIIF is what's not there. Um, so I've seen union catalogs come and I've seen union catalogs go and they scare me a little bit. So I wouldn't want to go for the full union catalog approach if it, if it were me, of course, and that's other people might have more energy and patience than I do. Um, what I was thinking primarily was a listing of holdings by institutions um, with a minimum of metadata available, possibly shelf mark. Um, anything beyond that is nice to have. Um, so from a registry point of view, what I'm thinking of is something that lists both digitized and non-digitized um, material, a material that might be held in bindings of books and things like that, so that you get a full comprehensive sense. And then where I'm suggesting IIIF might play in is if those materials are digitized, have them avail the manifests for those available as a link within the registry. And so you, as, um, as we've heard uh, from our, our colleague on Twitter, but also from in experience with Parker on the web and places like that, people tend to be searching for uh, holdings that they know about through other means. For instance, uh, a reference in a, a, a citation in a publication or a reference elsewhere, or they're finding material through uh, Google or aggregators. Uh, so in many cases, they may already know where the content is that they're looking for, and a registry would be able to give them both uh, an official citation for that, and then if in IIIF, a link to the content. So that, that's kind of where I'm thinking, just a, as minimal and basic as one could possibly get. Lisa asked in the chat if it would then be necessary for all participating institutions to standardize the metadata in the manifest header. And is that likely to happen? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Lisa. So um, IIIF in general uh, is absolutely agnostic about what metadata institutions stick into their manifest headers. Um, but there is a link to structured metadata within the manifest as well. Um, so it's unlikely, at least in my opinion, it's unlikely that institutions would standardize on which metadata fields they're putting into their manifests, but it's quite likely that they would uh, standardize on linking out to structured metadata in whatever flavor they happen to be serving. So there might be some way of harmonizing across the various metadata standards to pull a title or a shelf mark or something automatically. Does that answer your question, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That's that's the big question mark, right? Is how how if we IIIF doesn't impose a a, a data uh, data format or a data standard on top of the um, the manifest, then how can Digital Scriptorium fully take advantage of that? I mean, I, that's sort of what the Lisa tried to do, right? To to figure out how to do these searches across different. Um, that's right. And, that, and as I mentioned, that's sort of an expensive prospect. They've actually put in the time and money and, and person power to harmonize metadata across wildly disparate um, holding institutions. 
and so far they've been very successful with that, but long term that's that's quite challenging. Um, and I guess it'll remain to be seen if that's if that's a, a really good strategy to take. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, all really important points to consider. Um, so uh, next up is me. So I have the honor of uh, introducing myself here. Um, and let me just share my screen. Um, so um, before I was the um, the project manager for the DS 2.0 planning grant, I worked on the Schoenberg database of manuscripts for many, many years. And um, in my job at the Schoenberg database, I participated in the project I'm going to be speaking about today, which is mapping manuscript migrations. Um, as you can see from this image and the project's title, um, our aim with MMM was to build a data set to study provenance and the movement of manuscripts across time and place. So what you're looking at here is a visualization that we produced of manuscripts moving from their places of production to their last known locations uh, with our MMM data set. So um, mapping manuscript migrations uh, was funded um, under the Digging Into Data uh, challenge, which was uh, funded by the Transatlantic Platform. Um, this uh, challenge was designed to support um, large scale uh, big data analysis applied to social sciences and humanities questions. And our partners in this project included the Bodleian Library and the Oxford e Research Center at the University of Oxford the IRHT in Paris, and uh, the Semantic, Com Semantic Computing Research Group at Alto University in Helsinki. Each of the partners were funded by their own national agency and institutions, so our work at the Schoenberg database was funded by the IMLS and supported by the Penn Libraries. Our overarching goal for MMM was to unite our separate data sets into a single database. Um, and we wanted to not just uh, create a new unified data set, but we wanted to make sure that the data was shareable and reusable. So we published it as linked open data, uh, which is a series of best practices for publishing structured data on the web. It means that we published our data in RDF, we linked it to other resources, um, and we expose that data so that um, anyone can access it via a Sparkle endpoint or our user interface, which we created for um, less technically skilled uh, researchers. And we used our data set to answer research questions and ask new questions about the history of manuscript migrations and to visualize those movements over time. And I'm happy to say that we accomplished all of these goals uh, with MMM. So the three data sets that we combined were the Schoenberg database, Bibal at the IRHT, and the Medieval Manuscripts in Oxford Libraries digital catalog. Um, these are three very different data sets. Um, they all store data about manuscripts, but they all do that in very different ways. So the Schoenberg database is an SQL relational database with its own unique data model. We have over 240,000 records documenting observations of manuscripts. And we also manage our own name and place authority. Um, it links to um, standards like BIAP and the Getty Thesaurus of geographic names, but it, it's still unique records that are managed in house. And that's very similar to Bival, um, which is another manuscript database. It's used for provenance research, just like the Schoenberg database. But it's a, it has its own unique data model, um, and it describes manuscripts that are mostly held in French collections now. Um, and these two data sets are very different from the third data set, which is the Oxford Library's manuscript catalog. These are TEI XML documents. And those records are documenting um, manuscripts that are physically located in Oxford collections today. And that's about 9,500 manuscripts. So to combine uh, these three data sets, we had to come up with a, a data transformation process. 
And I want to emphasize that this diagram is a very simplified version of what actually goes on to get all of this data um, into um, our unified data set. So we start off on the left with our three separate databases. Um, and the first step here is to get each uh, individual data set into RDF, which is the standard um, for publishing linked data. Um, at this point, we still have three distinct data sets, but they're now um, all in RDF. Um, so they have to be transformed a second time um, against our unified MMM data model, which I'll show you in a second. Um, only at this point can we actually say that we have a uh, unified data set that can then be accessed via the MMM user interface or our Sparkle endpoint. And I want to emphasize here that there's a lot of computing that's going on with this data transformation process, but there's a ton of human labor involved as well. Um, just to produce these original RDF ex oh, oh, sorry, um, these original RDF exports, um, that required a domain expert at each institution who both understood the original data um, and knew enough about linked data to produce an RDF version of that data. Um, and then after that work was done, we were dependent on our colleagues at Alto University who designed the unified data model um, to transform these three data sets and um, unite them into our MMM unified data set. So um, there's a lot of, of human labor involved and this was just to combine three data sets. And if we're thinking about ingesting data from hundreds of institutions all across the United States to build DS 2.0. Um, we're going to need to think about this process really carefully and and try to find a way to make it simpler. Um, so next I wanted to look at the MMM data model and I want I wanted to give you something to compare it to. So first we're going to look at the original Schoenberg database data model briefly. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Um, the Schoenberg database model is very simple um, compared to what you're about to see. There's um, five main record types, sources that describe manuscripts, entries that represent um, descriptions of manuscripts, and then we link together descriptions of manuscripts as they appear over time via the manuscript record. And then we have name and place authority files appearing throughout these three records. Um, so this is pretty simple. If everyone in this room, um, you know, studied this data model for a few minutes, you would understand it. Um, so now let's look at the MMM model, which is um, vastly more complex. Um, and it's, that's great because, um, because of this linked data model, we were able to um, ask and answer much more complex questions questions we hadn't even thought of at the beginning of the project um, because the data model was, was so much richer um, and all of the relationships between the data is modeled much more precisely in a linked data format. Um, so you don't need to understand much about this data model um, for this presentation, but I just wanted to show it to you so you could see um, the type of complexity that's required to create this rich big data set that's used for research. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, that even though this looks kind of scary, uh, what we did was we just extended standards and ontologies that already existed. Um, so all the yellow boxes here, these are all Ferber concepts. Ferber is how um, libraries model bibliographic records like the work expression manifestation item, I'm sure many of you have heard of. So we extended that and applied that to MMM. And we also used um, CIDOC CRM to model our provenance events. And this is another standard that's used um, all around the world to model events. Um, so by doing that, we ensure that our data um, is easy to understand as far as other data sets are concerned. Um, it would be easy for, well, maybe not easy, but it would be very possible to link the MMM triple store to other data sets that used these same standards. And it's also easy for other people to understand um, who are at least familiar with Berber and CIDOC CRM. Um, so in practice, this is what a manuscript record in the MMM user interface looks like. 
And um, these records are very long and you have to scroll through them. So it doesn't transfer as well to a slide, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, so this is a record for a manuscript that's at the BNF now. And you'll see we have production events and various owners and collections that this manuscript has been a part of. And um, this data is coming from multiple data sets. So you'll see we have um, two production events um, these are coming from probably Bibal and the Schoenberg database, and they each described um, something about the production of this manuscript. So in the record, you can see um, where the data is coming from. You can actually click on these and see the data sets um, that the data is coming from. Um, and um, MMM is online now. I'll chat out the link to the user interface at the end, and um, you can all play around with it. Um, so I wanted to end by just talking about some lessons that I think DS can learn from our project. Um, the first thing is to be realistic about what you can accomplish in a given time frame. I mentioned that we achieved all of our goals um, that we set out at the beginning uh, of the project, but we did have to get a one year extension to finish the grant. And that's fine, but I think it's something we need to consider um, as we're thinking about an implementation funding for DS. Um, we aren't going to be able to create a union catalog or a complete registry um, unless we get a grant that lasts for 10 years or so. So I think we should plan for what we can accomplish during the grant period, whatever that might be, and then what we'll need to, um, to continue working on or will need to happen later on. Um, either through more grant funding or institutional support or whatever. Um, secondly, uh, using the same standards and applying them in the same way as other projects is really important. It not only saves you uh, time, <laughs> but it makes your data interoperable and easier to understand both by humans and computers. I think this is something that, that's definitely doable for DS, um, especially since there aren't even um, controlled vocabularies in the current version. Um, this is this is definitely something we can improve on. Um, third point, recognize and plan for the labor involved in data updates. Uh, this is going to be a huge issue for us if we're wanting to harvest or ingest data from all the institutions in the United States that have manuscripts. Um, I don't really have any ideas for how to solve this issue other than saying that the more minimal the record in DS is, the easier it will be to update and ingest. Um, and then finally, I was thinking about what DS can offer that doesn't already exist in other projects. You know, there's so many manuscript uh, data projects out there, um, but what's really missing is persistent unique identifiers for manuscripts. And the technology is there, I think. It just has to be implemented. And um, we need leadership to make it happen. And I think DS can definitely um, fill that role if we decide that's what we want to do. Um, so that's, that's my spiel. I'm happy to um, answer any questions. I know that was uh, really fast going through MMM, so I'm happy to to talk more about it. Um, and let me also chat out uh, the link to our website. No questions? <laughs> um, if no, oh, here's one from Amy. In MMM, I'm sure some metadata points from the three partners were easy to line up. Were there any that were surprisingly difficult? Oh gosh, yes. Um, I guess I'll just say um, the one that first comes to mind is works. Um, this is a big problem anywhere. So like the, just the conception of what a work is versus a text um, is tricky. What made it difficult for MMM is the Schoenberg database doesn't have a concept of a work. We don't have standardized titles. Um, and that's partially because so much of the data in the Schoenberg database is coming from non-library sources like auction catalogs. 
Um, so we don't even have an idea of, of a work um, with B. Ball and the Bodleian Libraries. They both have a work concept, but they defined it differently and neither of them were actually using work as it's defined in Ferber. So um, <laughs> we ended up having to do a lot of manual um, harmonizing of the data. Um, and I'm not actually sure how successful that was in the end. Um, if you're browsing the MMM interface now, you'll see um, it's difficult to search on um, works and titles. So that we weren't able to like perfectly harmonize the data by the end of the project, but that wasn't necessarily something we anticipated doing either. Thanks. All right, well, if there's no further questions, I will hand the screen over to our final presenter of these planning meetings, Deborah Cashin. Deborah is an associate professor at St. Louis University and holds an MA and a PhD in art history from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh. At SLU, she holds two positions in the university libraries, one as a digital humanities librarian and two as assistant librarian in the Vatican Film Library. She has also served as SLU's associate director of the Center for Digital Humanities and most of her work focuses on digital libraries. Her digital projects have included Broken Books, a project to reconstruct the dispersed Languedoc breviary using IIIF and Mirador, and Metascripta, for which she has re recently received a $160,000 grant from the SLU Research Growth Fund. Deborah is also president and executive director of Digital Scriptorium and serves on the editorial board of Manuscript Studies. Deborah also contributed to Sukioka Kogyo. I know I'm uh, butchering that pronunciation, The Art that's of good. the No. <laughs> um, and that's an online catalog raisonne of Japanese woodblock prints, which just recently completed at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so, Deborah, the screen is yours. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you uh, for that great presentation. And thank you, Ben Albritton, for yours. It's great to have to present to an audience where I feel so comfortable and know so many of you and have so much respect for all of your work. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I want to, uh, I want to let you know too that, um, uh, that uh, my, I have a colleague here with me, uh, Ben Baklar is the software architect of the, uh, the uh, Metascript project. And I just want to recognize Ben for his work and help on this project to get it to where it is today. Uh, my presentation isn't a PowerPoint, it's going to be live, so ask for your patience, but you'll also be able to try out what I'm showing you later, and when you do, please send me any of uh, your thoughts or suggestions about this project. So this kind of represents a soft launch for us. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Am I gonna find my screen, I hope? Here we go. Okay. Metascript is a large scale digital humanities project for which I serve as project investigator at St. Louis University. The immediate goal of the project is to digitize and create online research tools for 37,000 pre-modern manuscripts scripts originally microfilmed at the Vatican in the 1950s after the destruction and loss of many works of art and cultural heritage during World War II. And the website um, for the new, the, the URL for the new website is metascripta.org. I wanna show you this website too. Um, I have, if you're interested in more about the background of Metascripta, and it's, it's really has a fantastic and interesting history that includes that one of the founding fathers was a member of the Monuments Men in World War II um, anyway, this website will tell you about that. It's a website I built when I first started the project, but I keep adding to it. And that's at metascripta.omega.net. So you will see that Metascripta is a multifunctional digital resource that addresses some of the challenges also faced by digital scriptorium. 
Those challenges include, include the scale of the collection, which represents almost half of the 80,000 manuscripts in the Vatican Library. We presently only have a fraction of that uploaded to the website, but that's what we wanted to do. So um, just to build out the, um, the, the first one version, which we call 1.0. Um, like many contributors to Digital Scriptorium, we also faced a lack of descriptive records for most of the collection. The legacy was compounded by the fact that three quarters of the manuscripts in the Vatican also lack descriptive metadata records. And that includes VATLAT 3199, the 14th century manuscript of Dante's Divine Comedy that you're looking at. And then you'll see illustrated throughout the uh, manuscript the website, usually in montages that I put together in Photoshop. If you search for this manuscript, for example, in DigiVatLib, which is the Vatican's um, uh, digital catalog, you'll find it. But if you don't know that about it because I told you or because you read about it, you probably won't find it because it doesn't have a metadata record. So a, a great deal of the purpose of Metascript and the reason I came up with that name was it's not just a digital library with a regular catalog. It's really designed to help um, discover. It's a discovery tool and discovery tool was really important for um, the project. When I first, let me show you this. When I first started working at the Vatican Film Library SLU, I was asked to catalog and digitize all their 66 original manuscripts to include them in Digital Scriptorium, which I did, and it took me about two years. But along with my other job responsibilities, um, they asked me to catalog, they wanted me to catalog the manuscripts in the microfilm collection. Now I can write a de detailed mark record with relevant authority controls and upload it to OCLC and uh, the local OPAC catalog at a rate about one a week. So if you do the math, 37,000 manuscripts divided by 50 records a year, they were asking me to do something that was gonna take me 750 years. So, let's see. So clearly there needed to be another option and one that abandoned traditional library cataloging based on the main access points of author title and, and the one that required a complete understanding of the text. We just weren't gonna be able to do that. So what the VFL needed, I decided was a drive-by antiques roadshow style approach that could be produced by quickly trained grad students, but still help scholars discover manuscripts in their areas of interest. So we have a discovery um, search tool that lets you find manuscripts according to people's areas of specialization, which myself as a manuscript scholar know and I'm, I'm familiar with looking for manuscripts according to their country of origin, the language they're written in, and the century that in which they were created. So instead of going through the discovery tool, which will take too more time, I'm just gonna look at I'm going to look at VATLAT 3199, which is digitized in the collection. So this is what a landing page for VATLAT 3199 or any other manuscript looks like. And um, uh, what, I, what I want to show you too is the metadata that we created for this. What we came up with was a five point metadata schema based on shelf mark, country, century, language, and one citation. To those attributes, we added the VFL roll number, the date digitized, the right statement, and parsed out other values, such as a codex number, part number for manuscripts split among different roles, and the collection. But you can see there's no traditional library cataloging going on here at all. There's no the major access points of a mark record are author and title. They're not even part of this record. And then what you can do, what you can do with a page, what happens when you land on a manuscript, once you've discovered it by either language, country, century, or all of those combined, is you have a preview um, tool here that's very similar to the one if you've uh, ever seen it on the Beinecke um, Medieval Manuscripts website. Um, and, and you can look at these in a, very quickly because these are low res, see, there we go. These are low resolution JPEGs. It lets you uh, 
breeze through the manuscript pretty quickly to see if this is really what you want to look at. If you want to look at it, um, and this is economical for us because of access to our um, images and Amazon Web Services. If you want to look at it in Mirador, you can call up the images from the Cantaloupe Web Server. And here you go. Now we're looking at um, high resolution JP2s made from our TIFFs in the Mirador viewer. And what's wonderful about this collection, um, it, yes, yes, it's reproductions. They're not, it's not from the original manuscripts, but they're wonderfully legible because of the, the old um, silver gelatin process that Kodak used to make microfilms in the 1950s, when, and at, at which point uh, microfilming was state-of-the-art technology. So let's go back to the... Now, you, so you can, you can look, you can preview the manuscript, you can view it in Mir Mirador. You could download a PDF made from high resolution JPEGs for this manuscript out, it's gonna be about 200 megabytes. And then that PDF of course is a, um, basically a zip file of those JPEGs. You, can, you could extract all the JPEGs from it using Photoshop. But then we have another aspect of what can you do with this manuscript. And that's because we found a strategy for managing scale, scale and discovery. But again, like many instit institutions in DS, we lack the breadth of expertise to evaluate manuscripts from diverse cultures, languages, and time periods at a granular level. So building on the discovery metadata, my question was, would there be a way to possibly still create fully descriptive records for all of these manuscripts? And this is, what, this is where the contribute metadata function goes to our crowdsourcing catalog. The crowdsourcing catalog um, let's, enables users to use, um, let me see, where am I? To, to uh, contribute records, sorry, I lost my place in my notes, uh, to contribute catalog records by first, they have to register and log in, and then you can, you, by submitting a record, you agree to give your consent to share, can share that information. Um, and for version 2.0, we plan to extend the reach of this catalog through the use of linked open data. Um, and Ben's already built the ontology in the turtle file for the meta, metadata template. But so what we're asking our users is to help catalog 80,000 manuscripts at the Vatican by, I think, having fun using this metadata template. And you can either register or log in. You can do it right now. This is all live and working. Um, I'm going to, I'm already logged in, so I'm going to go here. There's a set, there's a page with instructions that also you can, um, explains how the records work. It's a faceted record that resembles the DS record in terms of the, its division in, um, into three um, intellectual um, uh, areas of context carrier content. It's not nested though, or in any kind of hierarchy the way um, the DS records are. And we also, I also have pages about the metadata standards and about the authorities. And the reason I have a page about authorities is because what our metadata template does is trains a person who we assume knows a lot about manuscripts, but not a lot about, meta, uh, about library cataloging to catalog a manuscript and using control vocabularies and um, authority records. So if you go to the contribute record um, page, this is where, let's see, here we go. This is our metadata, our crowdsourced metadata template. You can see it has tabs for carrier content, um, uh, context. Um, you can also use it to get back to uh, the glossary. We have, a, we have a data glossary for each part and to the authorities. You don't really need them. I'm going back to context for a second because the template is so elegantly simple and Ben built this and it's like wonderful, I think. What, what, what you have here is you have your attributes organized by the three facets, and then there's little uh, information uh, buttons that, that you hover over and that explain what that attribute's about. Um, and then next to it is where you link it to a persistent URL that identifies the value of the term. So here, these have been pre-populated for 3199. The city of present location is Vatican City. 
and the, the pearl that links to the defined Vatican City is from GeoNames, and here's the pearl. Um, and, and the same thing with the institution is the Catholic Church, the institution we're located. The pearl here is a persistent link to authorized term. The suggested authority is VIAF, and VIAF, of course, does have a, a, a record for that, uh, that defines that institution, and um, et cetera. When you go to, um, if you look at carrier, um, there's, uh, there's uh, for example, there's a, this is where you want to tell, uh, you, want to, you want to add to the record uh, what century the manuscript was made in. We're talking about the physical characteristics of the manuscript. And here you could put 1300 to 1399. And then you can go to the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus and find a, um, a URL, a, a pearl, a persistent link that defines that century. Um, and I'm very grateful to the Getty because the Getty actually made that, um, added those, um, those uh, of authority records to AAT when I asked them to because I couldn't find uh, ontology for centuries or dates anywhere on the internet and the Getty made them for us. So um, the, the, the crowdsourcing template walks you through how to, um, how to catalog the whole record. And then when you're at the end, you can submit the record. Um, and then we'll keep a track of some red records so that when you, when you do log in, you can see what manuscripts already have records submitted. Um, we haven't quite worked out um, how, if you want to look at those records yet, um, what, you know, um, how will you make them available to all our users. But I think we'll work that out when we do the, uh, when we do the, um, the graph database for uh, linked open data. So and then the last part of the menu of the of the Metascripta website is let's see if I can get to it. Oh, here's our here's our ontology, and here, by the way, is the the turtle document that is, stands for uh, terse terse URLs for triple language. I think is what turtle stands for. Um, let me see. Here we go. The last part of the uh, the the manuscript, the website that's still under construction is we call it the scholars workbench. But I can give you a, a live demo of what that how that works. Um, the the workbench is part of the project um, that was based on the simple annotation server that I learned to build in my old laptop at a Binecki seminar led by Ben Albert and Lisa Fagan Davis. It was uh, developed by Glenn Robson, who's the IIIF technical coordinator, and who I'm very grateful to Glenn because he's been working with Ben to take what he designed to be a simple local host server and develop it into a cloud server on AWS with user authentication tools. So what, how this will work is you will be able to log in for uh, space in the workbench, and um, you'll be able to work on manuscripts here, not just on ours, but any manuscript that's got uh, a uh, uh, IIIF manifest and annotate those manuscripts and then save your work your, on a, like a reserve shelf that every time you come back, the manuscripts you're working on will be there and it will also save your annotations. So now I'm gonna try to show you, hopefully this is gonna work. There is a page that explains the, the um, Scholar's Workbench here. Here I'm in the Scholar's Workbench live now. And if you go, if you just open up the, um, the, the reserve shelf, it shows that I've saved three manuscripts here. Um, VATLAT 3199 from the microfilm collection, VATLAT 3197 from DigiVATLib, and another uh, Divine Comedy manuscript that's at the Ricardiana, it's Ricardiana uh, 1035, the Ricardiana Library in Italy. So let's just open these up. Okay, and then I have, visit, I have saved annotations to these manuscripts to my account. They're not on my laptop, it's in my account in Metascripta. And you can see there's annotations on that manuscript. VATLAP 3197 is a press copy made from VATLAP 3199, was made by uh, Pietro Bembo, who ended up owning the manuscript and inherited from his father, who was a great book collector named Bernardo Bembo. 
I'm trying to find where I, what page I annotated here. Um, just a second. Here we go. Here's the, these are all the beginnings of uh, the first canto of Dante's Inferno. This, this, this uh, manuscript, then Pietro Bembo gave it to his friend Aldous Minutius and it was used to, um, as the press copy for the 1502 first Aldine edition of the Divine Comedy. And then this, uh, the manuscript in the Ricardiana is also int very interesting 14th century manuscript of the Divine Comedy, again, because the one in the Ricardiana is an autographed manuscript of Boccaccio. Boccaccio owned both these manuscripts. He made the one in the Ricardiana. He commissioned the one in the Vatican, but over here you can see this dedication is in Boccaccio's hand, written to Petrarch and signed by Boccaccio down here. Um, what's great if you haven't you ever used, now, so now I've got three manuscripts here from three different repositories. This is the kind of thing Ben Albert was explained to you today. Um, what's also uh, wonderful about the IIIF annotation tool, let's open them up. So you can see here, I made an annotation that says this is Inferno Conta, uh, Conta 1. Just want to see where, I, okay. And then, and what's wonderful is you can open this up and embed um, hyperlinks into here. So I'm going to say open this in a new window. And what I've linked to here is the um, um, the uh, digital Dante website at um, at Columbia University, where I can look up here, I can look up the uh, text and translation of what we're looking at in at the beginning of Canto One. And down here, there's the Italian, and then also here's two different English version versions translations of that. If I if I open up the if I open up the uh, trans the sorry the annotation I saved here it tells you it's Pietro Bembo's copy of the Aldine edition and then if I I click on there I go to hyperlink of of the Aldine edition the one that happens to be in the Newberry Library that also has uh, illuminations um, <clears throat> and uh, but again the the exact same text that you see in Vatlat three one nine seven because it was made from that manuscript edited by Pietro Bembo. Um, again, here's another um, annotation that I added to the uh, Riccardiani manuscript, and that one is about is uh, from the Brown University Decameron Web, where there's an article about Boccaccio as scribe. So this is a this is basically it's a digital work place for um, for scholars to do work on these manuscripts however you want to um, and um, also what's uh, I'm going to get rid of these other two manuscripts what I'm hoping to it's point at some point too is to work on this um, function here that's part of Mirador if you notice right now um, it's an, it's a kind of index it's keeping track of the annotations I've added to this manuscript um, their search function isn't isn't working right now, but what would be great is if you could use that search tool to, to search your annotations. But the other thing I would like to use this index for is to be for the user to be able to build the table of contents so to add a structure um, to the content or add a structure about the carrier. You could use it to um, um, uh, trace the ranges of your uh, construction based on choirs. And you could even use it uh, to structure the history of your manuscript um, in terms of layers of additions to the manuscript. What came first? What came second? What came third? All of those things are, I uh, hope, to be tools in this space so that what I envision is for users to be able to build new digital editions of manuscripts that are basically um, a 21st ver century version of printed facsimiles with commentary volumes, but all in one digital file. So anyway, that's pretty much, that's, um, I hope that, um, that we're going to have this real soon. Like I said, um, Ben and Glenn are working on it as we speak, but thank you very much for listening. I'm so glad I can talk about this in the present tense. And, um, and I hope that some of these ideas might be able to help us solve some of the problems for digital scriptorium. Thanks very much. Thank you, Deborah. I'm, if you look in the chat, you'll see everyone commenting about how 
amazing and exciting this project is. Um, it's just oh, awesome. astonishing. It's great. Yay! Thanks, guys. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Deborah? You're just getting accolades, Deborah. No questions. <laughs> oh, Kibblechim. My friends, has, they, they know yeah. how long I've been working on this. <laughs> um, Kibblechim, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. This is amazing, really. I agree with everybody. Um, I'm of course, especially interested in the crowdsourcing catalog part. And I know you said that you're not clear how it's going to work yet, but um, is it possible for people to enter partial information, for example, or do they have to fill out everything about a single manuscript? And how do you envision, I don't know, displaying these uh, different contributions? Right. Um... For, well, the way the way we have it working right now is one user makes one record, but you can save it and work on it as long as you want. You can submit it, and if you only if you wanted to submit partial information, you could do that. We haven't quite decided yet how we're going to like sort of aggregate or collocate uh, uh, submissions, especially for the same manuscript. Um, but I right now I'm, what I'm picturing is that. Uh, there's so many manuscripts to catalog. I'd rather encourage users to do one that hasn't been done instead of everybody dogpiling the same manuscript, which we all, of course all love to do because we love to have conversations about manuscripts. So if we're all working on the same one, it's more fun. But I mean, what the idea is to really try to catalog as many manuscripts as we can in a lifetime. But yeah, we haven't quite worked out like how will we, uh, Ben has it already working so that you will, um, I think he does. Ben, are you there? Uh, you want to talk about this? Uh, like, can't the won't the user get back a, a record of their um, the the entry when they submit it? Yeah, I just shared a quick link to the prototype uh, in chat. Um, but yeah, we have multiple options for what to do with the data, including an email copy, CSV, uh, kind of a web display. And then we'll see how far we can go beyond that to some kind of more formal structured metadata. Um, and the key thing you'll see missing in the current prototype is that the, the pearls aren't actually hyperlinked or connected to the values submitted. So that's like a key thing we need to patch up because that's the, at least a starting to be a semblance of linked open data. I see a question for you, Deborah, in the uh, chat. Emma, can you read? Yeah, it for we have me? a couple. Um, so Daniel asked first, um, why did you choose VIAF and not LC? Oh, it, it depends on the uh, it depends on the field, and it's just a suggestion. That's why you can go to the list of authorities. You can pick whatever authority you want, and a lot of times, like a, a geographic name, the Getty has a thesaurus of geographic names. The Library of Congress has a thesaurus of uh, uh, authority file for geographic names. So there, a lot of times there's more than one option. And I actually really, I, I don't think it matters, especially if we go to linked open data, it won't matter which authority they use. Um, the idea though is to, to, to standardize the authority, um, the data so that it does go to an ontology somewhere. And, and so we don't have problems like what we have in DS right now is say six different names for one script. So that you, you cannot like look up, you know, try to find, you know, Southern Textualis in, in DS. It'll be called a zillion different things. And so the, the idea is uh, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to define the, your terminology. You could write Southern Textualis, but you're gonna have to find a link in, in um, Getty or somewhere else that, defines that script and it's very likely it's going to say something like just plain old gothic. Uh, we had another question from Nick Herman. Do you have a way of integrating information from existing printed catalogs of the BAV or letting users know that info exists? Yeah, that, that, that's called grad students <laughs> is the answer. That's how my grad students, the, see the, the, the the BIV has these old printed catalogs written in Latin um, of their manuscripts, but they're 
there's, there's thousands of manuscripts that are not in those catalogs. In fact, the first time I went to the Vatican, um, when I was sent there by the VFL, I wanted to see the catalogs more than I wanted to see the manuscripts because I was sure that we were missing catalogs. So it turns out there's thousands, there's a huge gap in the VAT lats. It goes from like 2192 to 9847 or something like that. There's no records, you know, so, but so what our, what our grad students do, and I've got undergraduates that actually help them, is the first place they look when, before they start to catalog is they look to see if there's a, a Vatican record for a manuscript anywhere. We have a whole pecking order of places we look. And then that's why there is one citation with every record and you'll see that. And if it's in a Vatican catalog, that's a preferred citation, go there first. The second, second preference is to, if there's, a, if there's an article or, or a catalog entry in one of the studi testi volumes, which is the Journal of Vatican, that's second. But there's a whole pecking order of places we look for citations. And then we only just have one. We don't build huge bibliographies. It's like, if you wanna, if you wanna research this manuscript, start here. Again, like I said, it's drive-by. You know, if we can't do a thousand manuscripts a year with part-time students um, doing anything intensive. Great. Um, all right, so we are at the time to move to our breakout rooms. Um, thanks to Deborah and Ben again for presenting today. Um, that was a great way to end um our days of presentations uh, i'm gonna open up the breakout rooms now um as always if i put you in the wrong room just um flag me down for help and i'll i'll put you in the right one uh, but i i hope i got everyone in the right place Ben, you weren't here um, the previous days. Do you want to join a breakout group? Um, sure. Assign me where you think I need to be. Yeah. Um, let me see. Where should you go? I'll send you to a group with um, some other tech-minded people okay. for a good conversation. So your group leader will be Vanessa. Oh, Loki. great. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah. You should get a invitation. To join. Um, Patrick, I don't have you an, on a list for a group either. Did you want to join a breakout group? 